promotions and premiums came to the forefront as a means of adding value to brand purchases. This is a list of the brands that were created during the 30s. And it was really a heyday for innovation. A lot of it was the invention of shelf-stable products that fit in with the times and the challenges that people had. But if you scan down this list of brands, virtually all of them are leading products still available today. Came out of the Depression. New media thrived in the 30s. Radio became the age. Radio was the new media of the 30s. In the average household, radio was left on four hours a day. It was the top rated amusement. Soap operas were invented by Crocker and Gamble during the 30s. Bingo became popular. And piano sales plummeted, unfortunately. But you can see that um, there were a lot of, of changes that if you were an agile marketer and able to take advantage of the, the opportunities, you could do pretty well. So let's take a look at what happened during the, the current recession. Um, and it turns out that many of the brands that consumers say they actually prefer were losers. So we uh, conducted a study, and uh, ARX is a, is a business unit of, of comp stores, and they had um, actually conducted a study back, beginning back in 2008 uh, and 2009, and so I had them just update the study here in March of 2010. And it was a survey to determine if shoppers were willing to buy down or trade down or switch brands within different categories because of the challenging economy. Um, each of the studies focused on women who were purchasing in the category. We looked at the results across time to, with the, the objective of identifying patterns and commonalities. So these were the categories that we looked at. The sample size was about 1,000 women in the United States. So here we are just looking at the US. I know that Hugh is going to look at at, uh, at the globe uh, right after the uh, So these are the categories we looked at, a lot of consumer packaged goods categories, um, housewares, and the questions that were asked were um, how, focus on how do consumers shop in each segment? Do they buy the brand they want most? Do they buy a different brand if it's on sale? Do they convert to less expensive brands to save money? And you can see here that clearly uh, if you ask did you buy the brand that you wanted most, that there's been a steady decline across the two years of, of this recession. And so the percent of people who typically buy the brands they want most, um, down across most of the categories, and in March of 2010, less than 50% of shoppers reported buying the brand that they wanted most. And if you look at the data by individual category, you just scan from left to right, so you're looking across time, March 08, 09, and then 2010, you can see the way that um, there's been a steady decline across virtually all of these product categories. And if you look at the net shift, which is over on the right, you can see there's some variation across these, these categories, ranging from a high of a, a drop of 15 uh, points uh, in the OTC category, the apparel category, uh, down to a smaller but still decline of 5% for household products. And so, um, particularly in, in these CPG categories, that consumers were more likely to buy brand that they didn't want most uh, at the start of, of uh, the recession. Some categories have not seen uh, increased buying down from a brand perspective. We suspect that that's in categories where the manufacturers kind of led the way in what we call tiering, which is allowing consumers to stick with their preferred brand but a more attractive price. And it's pretty clear when you look at the data that for those manufacturers that were able and willing to offer some additional value, often in the form of some price incentive, that they were able to maintain their market share. If they didn't do that, almost inevitably their brand share would, uh, would decline. Bigger ticket items at the bottom here see larger increases, possibly due to the larger absolute saving on, on a single purchase. Um, so if they're not buying the brand they wanted most, what are they buying? And you can see here that for most categories, it's not been likely to shop the brand they want the most. It's not just restricted to buying brands on sale. Rather, you've got a sizable percentage of the change that you see here being driven by a decision to convert to less expensive brands to save money, which I think reinforces the point I was making, that it's all about value, and it's all about price, and if you're not willing to, to play in that game, I think the risk
worst case that you're going to lose out on. So some of the things that um, we think a brand can do to counteract these trends, so premium brands should invest in marketing and promotion activities to maintain their buying at preferred levels, and so minimize the amount of uh, erosion to less expensive brands, and then they position the brand for a bounce back in the economy rebounds. Now there's a lot of evidence, actually, if you look back at studies that have been done uh, in prior uh, difficult uh, recessionary or, or challenging periods, um, and I've listed the, the research here, that it's pretty clear that if you are able to invest in marketing and promotion and the like, that, uh, that the evidence, I think, is pretty clear that you are able to emerge from these challenging times in a strong position than you entered them. But there might be even more options available today, and I want to take you through two big winners. And the two big winners are in the digital world, and they are in the e-commerce sector, which uh, has been performing very well relative to total retail and continue to do so in these challenging times. I want to take you through um, what, what's been actually happening. This is US data. We're looking at the holiday shopping period, November through December of 08 compared to 09. Total e-commerce sales at the top went up 4% from 27.9 billion to 29 billion. But if you break these retailers out according to size, you take the largest 25 retailers in the US e-commerce market, they did really well. Their sales were up 11%. If you look at everybody else, they lost. They were down 7%. And if you start poking at what happened, what you find out is that the smaller retailers, and this maybe is true of smaller businesses in general today, really got hurt badly. They weren't able to compete with the larger companies that had the financial resources to market really aggressively. And it's playing out today still. It's a very, very sad picture in the US, I suspect, um, in, in other countries. It is very, very challenging for small businesses today to compete with the larger companies that are able to invest in providing more value to the consumer. So which of these particular, which of these large retailers did real well? You can probably guess some of the names. And the ones I want to highlight are Walmart and Amazon. And if you look at their market share during this time period, uh, it went from combined share of 10 points, 10% in the 08 holiday shopping period, up to 30%, three full share points in the holiday shopping period of 09. And they both were very, very aggressive at using price, but then also leveraging digital marketing. I want to show you how they did that, because it's very interesting. They were leveraging digital marketing in different ways. So at the top, I'm showing for Walmart, Amazon, and I, I wanted to put in uh, some other, the other top retailers, Best Buy, and then Yahoo Shopping in total. And the first set of data at the top looked at the number of display ad impressions that these retailers were running across the web and then on their own website. And then at the bottom, I'm showing the total number of paid search ad impressions that they were delivering. Right. What you see at the, at, at the top is that Walmart was really putting its money behind trying to drive traffic to the Walmart, web, Walmart website. So they were running impressions across the web rather than running them on their own retail website. In contrast to what Amazon was doing, which you could argue was a stronger force anyway to begin with in, in the e-commerce sector, but Amazon was putting its money against ads running on the site. So they assumed they had the traffic, let me didn't assume it, but they were driving then that traffic to convert to buying products off of the website. But what Amazon was doing, way more aggressively than anybody else, is they were running paid search impressions. They delivered 1.1 billion impressions uh, in December, in one month. They reached 128 million people with a frequency of 8.8. And clearly that was very effective. They're driving traffic to the website. Once they're on the website, they're running display ads against them and converting them. Uh, and Walmart, again, leveraging digital marketing, but in, in, in different ways. Um, so I think that these, to me, are um, two great examples of, of brands that actually strengthen their position. Now, some of the other ways that they were leveraging um, the digital uh, world is that they were running a lot of um, free shipping offers. Now, they weren't the only ones doing it, but uh, 
Uh, you might be familiar with the Amazon Prime offer where you pay one price and you get free shipping on all the products that you buy. That turned out to be a brilliant idea for Amazon. It was pretty clear that if you don't offer free shipping in these times, you're really running a big risk. And at the top of this slide, uh, there was also a study we conducted. Three quarters of consumers said that if they got to the checkout stage of an e-commerce transaction and free shipping wasn't offered, they would ship to another retailer. So that's how powerful um, free shipping is to come as an incentive. We have also saw, we also saw, I think, clearly the role of social media emerge as a major factor uh, during these times. So we asked the question in a survey, um, to what extent has social media influenced the holiday purchases? 28% of the consumers said it did. And when you look at what factors they cited, you see that product reviews was cited by part of reviews by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, consumer generated uh, reviews, 13%, expert reviews cited by 11%. Then you come to Facebook being cited um, with offers that were being communicated through fan pages and the like. And then the emergence for the first time of Twitter as a, as a factor. In the US market, in the space of one year, Twitter went from 2 million visitors per month to 20 million visitors per month. And it was pretty clear during the holiday time period that these retailers were running a lot of very aggressive communication of special deals, special offers. They ran and started running them well before the typical holiday shopping season um, had begun and were really, I think, able to, to preempt uh, their competition. And, um, you know, you can think of Twitter as a very, very cost-effective means of communicating. Uh, there is no cost, basically. Um, and um, these retailers really took advantage of it. So, um, bottom line, what did we learn from the most recent recession? Well, I think, first of all, we're reinforced with the lessons of the past. And if we don't you know, learn from our past mistakes, you know, we're condemned to repeat them. And it's pretty clear that a lot of brands uh, really ran into the same problems that have been run into in the past. So, uh, basically, if you're the preferred brand, premium brand or not, um, you need to deliver additional value if you're going to maintain market share in these session times. The second conclusion that I reached from uh, the work that we've done here is that I think this recession might well have accelerated our entry into a new marketing age. And I think that those, um, that, that new marketing age is going to be composed of, of, of a number of different factors. E-commerce clearly is it, has emerged as a significant sales channel. As an example, in the U.S. it's now approaching 10% of all products were sold in an apples to apples category uh, comparison with, uh, with retail. Um, pretty clear, and, and if you saw my remarks this morning, you know that I'm a believer in the effectiveness of online display advertising as both an effective and efficient brand building strategy. Search advertising, pretty clear, it's a very, very powerful direct response tactic. I think it plays at the bottom of the sales funnel. I think increasingly marketers are realizing that they have to overlay display campaigns on search. Uh, efforts. And I think we are now witnessing the emergence of social networking as a very effective and really, really efficient advertising medium. I'll give you one stat in that regard. If you look at Facebook and MySpace in the United States, they account for 20% of all the display ad impressions that are running across the web, but only 3% of all of the ad dollars. So you can see the disparity and the efficiency that, uh, that they afford um, retailers. So, those were my uh, um, observations and comments. Hope they were useful to you. I will now turn the podium over to you. Thank you, Vince. We're going to hear more uh, related subjects from a different perspective from Hugh Griffiths, EVP, Global Director of Marketing, Accountability, and Research at UM. Hugh. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit about um, Econic Curious. Econic Curious is a tracking study that uh, we uh, fielded back in November 2008 and then have continued to field um, throughout the session. Initially, started this study in five markets uh, the US, the UK, Germany, Spain, Australia. Um, and then, coming out of um, summer 2009, uh, and expanded this into uh, the brick markets. We had a hypothesis that there were clearly different trends that were emerging in, in, in these markets, and we really want to understand 
um, how they compared to the other markets we had, but also within brick markets, what trends we were seeing. So the research I've got here is from January 2010, um, and really what it does is take a look at quite a high level across the markets. Um, obviously, there's an enormous amount of data that we have here, and we can't really drill in at this point into uh, you know, market by market. But what we've done here is really try to see um, how the great markets uh, uh, are looking uh, as it relates to the session, how they're feeling coming out, how consumers are feeling coming out of the session uh, in those, but also whether or not you can think of them as a, a, a block of markets. One of the things that I think is really interesting in this data is that um, they're, they're just very different. I mean, particularly when you look at India and China and Russia, these markets are behaving incredibly differently, although at a very macro level they may look similar. Um, but the consumers within these markets are, are, are really expressing some very different values um, and are really feeling quite different in terms of the way that they're uh, coming out of this recession and how that impacts brands. So the point of this study uh, really was to not just look at um, how people are feeling uh, about uh, the, their personal financial situation, uh, but really it was about trying to understand what they would do as a result of that. So what categories and brands are they going to uh, cut spending on? Where are they going to focus their spending? And we really wanted to get at how behavior might actually change as a result of, uh, of the situation that they're going through. So um, I'm going to take you through some data. I apologize if uh, some of these charts might have a lot of information on them. I might try to summarize them as much as I can. Um, first thing we did was we asked people um, how they felt about their personal situation, what words they would use to describe. Um, uh, starting off with Andrew Sibley, the head of brand advertising at uh, Cisco, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, brands, content, media companies, and agencies working together. Hola! Buenas tardes! Ella está ahí, ¿son todos bien? ¿Sí? Okay. Um, that's the extent of my Spanish. Apologize for um, We've had a lot of interaction uh, on stage today at the conference. This is going to be no different, but we're not going to be using the keypad. Uh, a question for you all again. Who in this room was at the Gecko Bar last night and joined our fantastic hospitality courtesy of the uh, guys at Fox? Congratulations for making it. I know there are a lot more people there, and hence the gaps here. Um, so, congratulations for making it, and I have to say that um, I was there. And the concept and the beauty of the idea of the siesta now is clearly in And thank you very much indeed for not taking the siesta and coming to hear what I've got to say. Um, one of the, this is the whole conference theme is about rewriting the rule book. And one of the first rules I was, I was taught about presenting um, was never start with apology. So, in the, in the true spirit of this conference, I'm very, very, very sorry. Uh, the observant ones amongst you might notice that I am not Diane Duguay. Um, even if you don't know Diane Duguay, you probably realise I'm not there. She is our worldwide uh, director of uh, sorry, our director of worldwide media uh, operations, and she unfortunately couldn't make it across from San Jose. Um, so she sends the conference with best regards, and I'm kind of hoping I do her subject area for some justice. So please, what am I going to talk about? Um, start off with a little bit about video trends. Then uh, a short overview of our brand uh, campaign strategy. Um, two examples of, of a couple of interesting things in this, in this area that we've done um, as a result. And then what, really, what, what are the four key takeaways that, that we can then share with the conference in terms of what our learnings have been uh, over the years. So on the subject of video, what better way to start talking about video than showing you It connects people, players, and possibilities. It transforms little towns with big names. It makes every experience a social experience. It turns what you read into what you see. It crosses the line between fact and fiction. 
it seeks the truth. It's Cisco Technology. It motivates. It activates. It innovates. Yesterday morning's opening session, we had the first of the polls, and I lost I'm a great believer in the wisdom of crowds. Um, I was really quite surprised to see that only 7% of the audience thought that the, the, the video was, 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 gonna, yeah, was, was a brilliant minority. Um, particularly so that I think every speaker who's then come up onto this stage has then mentioned video in some way, shape, or form. Um, and as Cisco, you know, we, we really do feel that you know, video is the killer app because it's driven on through everything, all our technologies are there to enable video. Um, a couple of data points. Um, 15 billion devices will be connected to the internet, most of the video in the next three to four years. And I was particularly happy about this next one, um, Jan's presentation this morning, because uh, his data point coming to the very next year out, um, in that you know, mobile traffic will be kind of 64%, but by, in three years' time, video will account for 91% of all the internet traffic. So, um, yeah, we really do feel that video is, is really, really after us. And so it, it's the core of our business strategy, it's everything from uh, bits of it, which I hope some of you have had a chance to, to play with out of the foyer, through uh, the Tamburg acquisition, which closed yesterday, to our, our flagship telecoms. It's, it's really all about video. And, and what we try to do is really kind of walk the talk. So whilst well, video is, is key to our, our business strategy, we also embed it hugely in, in, our, in our marketing strategy. Um, the concept of the human network, which, which we've been um, running this for, for coming to its fifth year now, um, is, is the idea is, is the network isn't a network of, of, of things. It, it, it's things that are connected. We call the 90s of the internet era, where we were connected to things. But then the purpose of connected things was allowing people to actually use them to do wonderful things, um, again, to create stuff. So it's this concept of the network as a platform for our experiences. And that's where everything is possible, so we keep on seeing day in, day out, and hopefully we'll be seeing um, in the closing session today. Um, because together, you know, this whole kind of idea of collectivity and, and, and cooperation and collaboration, and collaboration um, we have been more, we're far greater than we ever could be in the And uh, I think somebody else talked about consistency. Our, our company vision has been about changing the way we work with the player and learn. And it's been that, we've, that has been a company vision for 15 years. So, a company that's only 25 years old, to have that vision for the majority of your, of your life so far, is really quite impressive. It actually does chart a really clear roadmap as to where it is you want to be as a brand. Um, to, to iterate on how we're doing this with brand campaign, um, most of you might be aware of Ellen Page, the actress. Um, she's a Canadian actress, um, and uh, we've run, run a campaign uh, largely online where she goes back to uh, a small hometown in Canada to see how that has been transformed. So if you could run the next two versions, please. Okay, class, our special guest is here. Hello, Paige. We're doing a lot of in China! Wow! <laughs> when I was a kid, maybe we could just go to the, the farm. Ah. <laughs> no, seriously, where are you guys going? In the unit classroom, see it, live it, share it on the human network, Cisco. Well, look who's here, it's Ellen. Hey, 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 wait, wait, wait. Hey, hey. Oh, Would you like to see our new police department? Yeah, all right. This way. Here it is. Completely networked. So you have any suits? She's on her team. Is that what you call? The new community, see it, live it, share it, on the human network, Cisco. So that hopefully gives a flavour of the brand campaign and the in which we're going. Uh, but that's obviously the only part of it. As, as Greg was talking about in the opening session this morning, you know, there's this huge part of you know, people and the consumers have never, never, have never had so much choice in what to consume or how to consume it. And this is massive oversupply of advertising, so how can the brand actually break through and break out? And, and, and really, you know, the video is very important, and also we've got to innovate. So I said I'd talk about two examples. 
Uh, one was with the New York Times, where we took you know, a whole uh, homepage uh, kind of, uh, site takeover on one day of the third this year, um, where we wanted to just show how, how video disrupts by using the video to disrupt the experience. And it just worked. What we did, we put the video stories, all the stories that on the homepage at the time, which when you went onto the, uh, uh, onto the New York Times, that's what came up. It then, as you'll see, kind of folds back into the, the app unit so you can click into come out and watch it at any time. And yeah, it, it was it really did come, was, was a real traffic stop. As you can see, you know, they're all going to go through the, 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 the detail. But it, it really was you know, moving from all the news that stick to print to all the news that stick to view. And there's a really good example of how you know, a, 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 a media brand that comes from the old heritage of, of the print can actually you know, survive in this new age and still be relevant and still deliver the use but in an innovative and use way. And why not be better for the consumer? Um, and indeed, we had uh, Tarek Sethi, who's the Chief Digital Officer of YR, who, who said uh, that morning after his blog, if you haven't already, you should check out today's online version of the New York Times to see one of the best, most important developments in online advertising today. And that's great because we did it through OpenV, not through YR. Um, the second thing is, again, looking at what we would say the old media, but uh, like broadcast media, uh, and that is a partnership with, with, with NBC, where uh, the Rachel Maddox show, um, is the first uh, show, first network uh, show, to use our telepresence for on-air live interviews. And, and, and the, the, the benefit of this is great for them. It means they can capture breaking news, they can actually get people into an office or into a location where there's, 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 there's a foreign telepresence unit. The interviewer can actually eyeball and just look at and, 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 and see the person they're interviewing on the blank screen, so that adds, adds to the body language, which adds to the better interview, which adds to the better experience for the viewer. At the end of the day, this is what the, 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 yeah, the, the TV station wants to do. Um, we also get the, the, the branding, and this really does de you know, demonstrate innovation and, and our whole brand uh, of essence, you know, of, 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 of enabling. You know, it's not about us, it's about what people can do without our products, technologies, and solutions. So that really goes through everything we do in, in uh, uh, product integration activities. Um, here are just a few titles from, from you know, past where we do, mostly in the US based. Um, because over in Europe, you know, it's only recently, you know, recently the, the, the laws being, being you know, the EU has decided to make it legal. And certain countries are doing it quicker than others. And in the UK, it's that major, major uh, TV producer and exporter um, that should be signed into law this year. So it'd be quite interesting to see what we can do. But what, what we do is we, we integrate, uh, we don't replace. So it's not the Simon Powell with his kind of coat, perfect position and every single shot. Um, yeah, and um, I think, uh, you know, someone said this morning, yeah, don't underestimate the, I think Mike, uh, Mike said that, you know, don't underestimate the intelligence of, of, of the consumer. Yeah, you see that, you see where it's mature, you see there's absolutely no relevance, it's just someone trying to play and sell stuff and an internal. What we do is we, 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 we're very, very keen that whatever you think is one relevant, is relevant to the brand as well. And so it's a Mike, you know, situation might not work, it doesn't damage the you know, counter to our, our values. Um, but it also allows the plot. Um, so you know, it, it, it's, it's something that the writers and, 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 and directors and producers can use to actually deliver a better content product to the audience. And whether it's going you know, to move from what we use in the UK is basically uh, TV shows about dead people, um, you know, waking the dead and all that kind of stuff, friends and better CSI, whatever. But we moved, as you see, the tone from the commercials I showed you. Moving slightly more humorous, so yeah, this is a uh, really good integration we've had with 30 Rock and the US uh, version of the office. So, that's just a couple of examples and, and, and the directions that we should go. I meant to mention we also do games, but we have uh, Splinter Cell, which is I think the most successful game in history, which was, was released, um, the latest version was released last Friday. And again, we're integrating every level of that where it's not like a, a, a driving game where you're using past billboards. That, that, yeah, when you're playing, you have to interact with the technology, you have to interact with the phones and the telepresence to actually get the boost to move on on the numbers through the game. So, again, a meaningful experience and even in a virtual way, a hands on experience. So, that's got an example of what we do. Um, what about the learning? What, what, what we'd we like to share with you? Um, first is you must be organised differently to succeed. It's not like running ads or anything like that. It's, 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 it's more integrations like sponsorships, 
Um, and and as, as uh, Martin showed yesterday, I love the fact that you walk with all the Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Original. And I uh, imagine that, that they'll have to go out and watch the football and enjoy it. Um, Rob John is someone's going to do it, right? Um, but you've got to manage, manage integrations like sponsorships, you know. Um, and I'll come to it again. The, the getting integration is just one thing you then have to go on and, and activate and benefit from it. Um, you must do it, it has some you know, resource itself. It's not something you can just offload to an agency and say, right, look after it. Agencies are actually vital. You know, we've got to meet with you over with a number of really good agencies, uh, obviously over the entertainment, uh, David Brown in, in Los Angeles, we have got a, a first place in, in, in the UK, who really are experts on these things, but you have to have resources yourself to actually help you know, manage and, and, and execute on, on, on the patients or the integration um, Similarly, you have to work with media partners to get it. A um, bit of a no-brain on that. Um, and first of all, tech companies, you've got to have your own tech in the start. Um, because you know, it's not the place that you have to go in, set the things up. So even the phones, you have to get a server, you have to figure it all, you have to power it up, and one more so that they actually work, which is, you know, for getting the data the one they're there. Um, and also, in turn, they take sponsors, an absolute must. You know, if you've got senior guys on board, then everything else is, you know, kind of close to much, 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 much more easy. And, and a number of shows in the States over the years we've had, you know, the CFO bringing on for the integration team going, when are we next in whatever episode is that? And, and yeah, they're keen on it, and, and it really then helps, you know, in, in the company, you know, demonstrate how good marketing it brings to the business and actually gets them some appreciation of what it is you're trying to do. Secondly, um, rights, you know, it's not good just putting something up there in the book, yeah, you can sort of try to negotiate, yeah, the, the, the requisite rights for you to be able to go and, Used to the, the footage, used to use, use, use the, the logo, the branding that, that comes from the programming in, in your marketing activities. So you know, engage with it. And I mentioned this a bit earlier, you integrate the essence of your brand and product into the content. And again, don't just stuff it on like in, in, in the X Factor or something like that because you know, it, it's transparently you know, it's, it's bad, it's what you can do. Um, it's not off the shelf, it's try and get some, some, uh, something different, something special. You know, go with something that's uncluttered. Or, or, or dominate it, and, and go for story first. Um, I mean, the, the, the New, York, New York Times was an example. It's a similar thing to what we did in the UK when the Times launched their Time on My TV in 2005. We were the, we were the launch partner for that. So we have Solus um, presence on, on the page, on the site, on tree roll and, and what have you, for the first time that the, 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 the media and such at the time. The, the print heritage really was solid to embrace um, to, 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 to media. Um, Again, the list of inspiration, so I've covered that, and, and, and make sure the content complements your brand. So, you know, it's got, you know, if, if you, you know, uh, if you're, if you're, if you've got strong ethics, strong values, and whatever, then you make sure that they're associated in, in program with it, is, is um, in any way, shape, or form, detrimental to that. And finally, oh, I better change that, because Paul Bay, for those of you who are watching Twitter, has playing his conference bingo. Um, so, I managed to get a 360 out of that, uh, that, that title slide. So Paul, if you're listening in, you know, don't mark me off on that. Um, but anyway, I think, I think this would agree with anything these days, you know, and, and, and there always has been, the other 360 is, is part of us of what you do anyway. You, you don't approach anything without that view. Um, and then you know, basically use your, your media partners' uh, kind of material to actually try to prepare this to your brand. So you're using their property, the stuff that you've done with them to, to promote you. You, know, you, you, you incorporate that in your marketing activity, activities with material. Make sure that also there's a quid pro quo with the, with the media partner, but they're actually kind of promoting your, your, your integration uh, or the partnership as well. So I think that was it. Yes, thank you very much indeed for what you say. I'm <laughs>